OK, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final session of the Customer and Support Services Overview and Scrutiny Committee's inquiry into working with and developing local supply chains. Uh, my name is Martin Eddy. I'm the Cornwall Councillor for the St. Clair Division, and I'm joined together, joined today by uh, three of my fellow councillors. Uh, and I wondered if councillors Mould, Keeling and Moorcroft would like to introduce themselves. I'm Councillor Keeling and I represent the Brieg, uh, Germo and Sydney division in the, in the west of Cornwall. Hello, I'm Carol Mould and I represent the St Mimber and St Andelian division, which is up on the north coast uh, around Isaac. Good afternoon, Councillor Robin Moorcroft representing Weybridge West. Councillor Frost sends his apologies. He's absolutely stacked out with work, but forgot to send apologies. So apologies for that as well. OK, uh, thank you. Um, so we have sought over a number of sessions to look at how Cornwall Council supplies it, uh, sources its suppliers uh, and look at any issues that they have in supplying the council. We want to understand how social value is currently introduced into and measured in our contracts and to explore what other local authorities have done um, to enhance social value and address climate change. We hope our work will produce recommendations to, to, to Cornwall Council around our, their operating models, key performance indicators and possible changes to contract procedure rules. And today's session is being recorded but not transmitted live. The recording will be available for the public to view online. Uh, we are supported today by a number of officers as we have a technical uh, presentation today and I'll ask them to introduce themselves as they uh, as they speak on that presentation. Um, but we must also remember that the current crisis that we're going through, COVID-19, is pulling staff away from their normal work, uh, both here and other local authorities. It's a period of change as we change our operating methods. And um, also this inquiry overlaps with a question to full council placed by councillors Kirkham and Desmond around Cornwall Council's procurement principles. So um, we appreciate the work of all our officers. Uh, we appreciate the work of the members and getting us to the line here today. Uh, and I must especially mention our committee clerk Tracy, who I know has worked very hard uh, to get us to this point today. We will be producing a draft report following today's session. Um, so members, if you're ready, uh, I've got an X in the box. Yeah, it's from me, John. Um, mm -hmm. I, we, we're, we're talking a lot about social value and I understand that's part of the Tom's model anyway. But can we not forget why we're doing this? We're trying to increase uh, the amount of local you know, we are spending 800 million a year on our third party supply chain. And the idea is to try and, you know, to increase the local side of that so we can reduce that cost. I just wanted to say that because I've been reading a lot about it this morning and I get the feeling sometimes we're moving away from that. But the main thrust is to actually increase our local supply chain, or at least the percentage. We're doing a good job. We need to do more. Social value, of course, is very, very important and part of legislation. I mean, I just thought I'd throw that in the mix, mm -hmm. all right? Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you for reminding of us that because our, our working title is working with and developing local supply yeah. chains. So thank you. That's a good point. Um, so we have a presentation today uh, before us. So we'll ask for that presentation to go along. I want to take questions as you go through the presentation with that's the easiest way or do, would you prefer that we kept our questions towards the end Rachel? Um, I think probably we ought to take them as we go I mean if I go through the agenda that we're going to kind of structure the presentation around and maybe we pause at the end of each part of the agenda um, and, and pick up any questions there. Yes okay let's that, do that. That's okay with you? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Meg, I think you're driving the PowerPoint, aren't you, for me? Or, or Tracy, are you doing that? I can just share. I'll share it right now. Thank you very much. 
so so well um whilst um so whilst meg is sharing that it might be helpful if i introduce myself um and then uh, colleagues from my team um, also introduce themselves. So um, I'm Rachel. I am the uh, head of commercial and investments at Cornwall Council. Sharon, do you want to? Yes. Hello, I'm Sharon Hamilton. I'm one of the managers in Rachel's team. Uh, hello. Yeah, my name's Sarah Wilson, and I'm the policy and strategy specialist. Um, and I sit in Sharon's team. Hello, I'm Megan, also in Sharon's team, working as a performance and systems specialist. Hey, okay. good afternoon, everyone. So I'll just, um, <clears throat> I'm Rob Buckley, also on the commercial team, but I'm working on uh, this inquiry as the technical officer. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. Um, Meg, can you just move on uh, from the first slide? Um, so what I thought would be really helpful today is to kind of recap very, very quickly in terms of, um, I guess, the, pre the current profile of activity in Cornwall. And I'm, I think there are two slides on that. I know we've had a, a, a much, much longer session on that, and I'm happy to pick up any more detailed questions. But so just to give you a real overview of that. Um, then I wanted to uh, move on and uh, give you an overview because things are moving very, very quickly, almost on a weekly basis, actually, at the moment um, in terms of kind of government government policy in this area. So I wanted to kind of give you an update on where we are in respect of that and how we're building our thinking into some of the uh, changes that we're looking at making um, as a team. Uh, the next point then is around giving you an update on our emergent thinking. So what I wanted to do was to uh, give an overview um, of where we think we're getting to in terms of our social value policy our, and our responsible procurement policy. So I wanted to uh, pull out some of the kind of key elements of that um, and give you an overview of that, because obviously that will also hopefully resonate with what you previously heard. I mean, then the final bit really is around just understanding what the next steps are. Obviously, we're now in December and what I wanted to do was to set out the further action that we've got to take and then where, when, where that will be going. And then obviously opening up for questions. But as I said before, uh, Chair, I'm happy to pick up questions as we go. I think some of this will be helpful to be as kind of as informal as it can be in terms of a really good discussion. So if we can move on, uh, Rob, um, or whoever's controlling this, thank you very much. Um, so, so I think um, you you will have heard from um, a a number of different councils, um, and obviously I had a briefing on uh, on, on the uh, the outputs of those discussions. But I think I think the first thing I want to really highlight is. Um, and it will be no surprise to you, but Cornwall is a very large unitary authority and it has a uh, a large, probably one of the broadest set of functions out of all of the councils that you heard from um, in terms of its uh, commercial activity. So we are we are really, really big. And that is reflected in the fact that we spend and I think uh, I think it was quoted earlier on nearly 800 uh, million pounds a year, 72 percent of our gross uh, budget. Um, and uh, we have a relationship with uh, over 5700 uh, different suppliers. And um, as I think I said to you before, even more contracts that we manage because many of those suppliers will have different contracts with them from across the organization. Um, at the time that this was done, uh, we were spending 56% of our spend on local suppliers. Um, and uh, whilst there are no real national kind of benchmarks around what we should be spending on our local supply chain in terms of good practice, when we did this piece of work with EY, effectively, they looked at a number of councils and identified that the approximate spend on the local suppliers was around 25%. Um, so um, I think uh, 
clearly one of the things that's really driving this, and I think we touched on this earlier on, is our kind of collective ambition to make sure that that £800 million that we're spending on the supply chain, as well as delivering the primary purpose of what we are wanting to procure, is maximising effectively the value to Cornwall. And I think that certainly kind of is at the heart of what I want to achieve. And I know it's what we want to achieve as part of the outcome of this uh, review. Um, and some of the things that we're going to talk, talk about today are about actually how do we think we're going to go about doing that in terms of making sure that £800 million worth of spend per year is really maximising the value uh, for Cornwall. If we can just move on to the next slide. So I thought it would just also be worth kind of recapping by directorate, um, the percentage spend and then the value of that spend that we are spending effectively on our Cornish suppliers. And I think it's really important that we just remind ourselves when we had the conversation about this uh, previously, the definition of what constitutes a Cornish supplier is effectively where the invoices are sent from. So i.e. that they have um, an office uh, that is linked to a Cornish postcode. And I think um, it's really important that actually we think about well, that's a fairly crude proxy. And what we're trying to do, I think, is to get behind that in terms of the spend on Cornish suppliers and saying, why is this important to us in terms of the value that it brings? And I think when we come to understand some of the TOMs later, actually, I think they become much, much more sophisticated indicators around really starting to ask and answer that question of value rather than a very crude proxy measure at the moment around where the invoices are sent from. I think, I think the other thing we've also got to really think about and be careful of is that this isn't about effectively wanting to exclude um, other parts of the market if uh, these are markets that are outside of Cornwall. But what we do want effectively, if people want to work with us in Cornwall, even if they are uh, multi multinational organisations or national organisations, they are bringing value though to Cornwall and that's effectively what's important. Um, and only last week actually I was having, uh, I was having a conversation with a, a, a large provider, uh, covers the whole of the country that was saying, look, I know that people are really, really interested in this in Cornwall. And I know it's really important, particularly in Cornwall. Um, how can we demonstrate the value that we are bringing to Cornwall? So I think I think that uh, it's it's an important question for suppliers uh, who uh, have a remit beyond Cornwall in terms of this this value question. So if we can we can move on. So. Um, I just thought it would be really helpful to kind of recap on the legislation. And I know that um, Mark um, and I have previously done a briefing um, giving you an overview that effectively our commercial activity operates within quite a complex set of legislation that determine effectively the rules of how we operate. And those are underpinned effectively by a set of principles which you've previously heard. <clears throat> so I'm not going to recap on that, but I do think it's just important in terms of reminding ourselves that actually we have to comply with a set of principles and a legal framework, and that determines effectively how we operate and it also uh, protects effectively the council. Um, in relation to social value, um, you will be aware from previous discussions that the Social Value Act uh, dates back to 2012. So uh, it's been an act that's been around for a, for a very, very uh, long time now. The, what's interesting, I think, about the Act is it does not make a mandatory requirement. It doesn't, does make, it doesn't make social value a mandatory a requirement. It asks us to consider it. Um, and I think that that probably has been reflected not just in our council, but in a large number of councils around um, around the leadership um, around this space. Um, obviously, as I said earlier, things are moving very, very quickly. Uh, you will probably be aware that very recently the government effectively has launched a new uh, policy note, guidance note. Um, called <clears throat> 0620 that makes it mandatory aqu across uh, central government uh, for a minimum consideration in terms of all new procurements 
around uh, a 10% weighting. So that PPN note at the moment does not extend to or is not applicable to uh, local government, but I think it's a very, very good barometer around where we're going um, as part of the emerging green paper, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, so 10% is the minimum weighting uh, for all procurements run by central government at the moment. Um, and we are, as I say, expecting uh, probably something very comparable to be coming out of effectively the policy reform um, in response to uh, in response to where we're going, uh, where we're going with Brexit. So the, the final point there is we're expecting some fairly radical reform around our procurement and co commercial uh, legal framework. Um, actually, only yesterday I was on a kind of briefing with central government around this space, and we're expecting effectively a green paper to be launched either at the end of this week uh, or early next week. And that green paper will be really, really important in setting out effectively uh, where we believe we're going to be going around the uh, around the new uh, procurement framework uh, going forward. Interestingly, at the same time they launch the green paper, there is also going to be a new PPN, a new set of policy around the approach that effectively government will be taking around below OJU. So that's a kind of a, a threshold um, in terms of value around below OJU threshold procurements. So I wonder if it's it would be helpful just to kind of pause here before I move on to the next set of slides, which is to talk a bit more about what we're what we're actually looking at doing to pick up any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Yes, members, um, any questions at this point? Um, uh, thank you, John. Yeah, just a quick one, Rachel. Um, when we last met, uh, you you said that we have an e-procurement system, but yep. don't have an e-contract management supplies relationship management system. Now, you know, when are we going to sort of see some improvements on that? Now we're going to see a joined up approach to that, because otherwise we're, we're you know, no matter what the government says to us, we're going to be in the doldrums uh, as we're as we're moving forward. Yeah. Um, um yeah, OK, I can pick that one up. It's no problem. And other colleagues might want to come in as well on this. So um, we have historically had um, an e-procurement system. Um, and um, I, I don't think it's, as I said before, I don't think it's been particularly friendly to people or our suppliers who want to use it. We have purchased a new system and the new system effectively will bring together exactly what you said, John, which is effectively uh, an e-procurement system alongside an e-contract management supplier relationship management system so we can have it all in one place. Um, yeah. So we purchased that system. We are partway through the implementation of that system now, because as you can imagine, there's quite a lot of work that we're needing to do around kind of business process redesign and embedding it. Um, and we're expecting to have that in place effectively by um, early April. That sounds really good. I'm just wondering whether in, in the same breath we could look at contracts in one place but a different system that holds payments to suppliers. I mean, is that the Oracle issue? Um, so, um, uh, Sarah, are you, do you want to just pick up the, or Meg, the issue around the interface between our contract system and effectively the relationship between Oracle? Yeah, I can do that. Oh, you guys are oh, Meg, no, it's fine, go on. Okay. Um, so Oracle at the moment, yeah, holds our payment information. Um, due North, there is a manual interface at the moment between our current e-tendering platform and that Oracle interface. With the new e-tendering contract management system we're implementing, we are looking to integrate Oracle and the flow of data into that new system so it will all be joined up as one approach. Yeah, that sounds very encouraging, actually. Thank you very much for that. And, and just, just, just adding to that point, I think... Um, um, previously, we've probably talked about the kind of concept of kind of category management, which is about understanding our different spend information across the whole council, so we can start to so we can start to segment our spend and start to think about shaping our spend. 
it has been a real challenge because of this interface between our payment system and the information that's held on effectively our procurement yeah. and contract management system about those two systems being able to talk to each other so that we really understand effectively spend data alongside contract data. Yeah. And this will resolve that issue. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. I think you made some very, very good points in your last in, in the last time we we, um, we we were talking about this. In particular, we need to be in a position to find information at the click of a button yeah. rather than spend time on manual interfaces. But thank yeah. you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no other questions, are you all right for me to carry on? Um, yes. Well, I, I have a question, if you, if I may. Of course. Um, of course I've, I've got five thousand. We've got five thousand eight hundred suppliers, and, yep. and um, I, I understood the direction to travel was to reduce the number of suppliers that uh, we were dealing with. Is that would that be uh, the assumption, or can this new system manage a large number of suppliers? I assume that uh, dealing with a, with a huge hundred, over a hundred thousand invoices. Um, is is part of the problem, especially if there's a sort of a manual link between the procurement and the payment. Yeah, so so I don't think we we haven't set out um, what is uh, the right number of suppliers because clearly that would determine as an organisation what we wanted to commission. I think that what we have identified though is that in some areas of our business we've got. Um, what I guess in the commercial world is described as tail spend, where we've got lots of low value transactions that actually we think that we could probably contract for better. So just to give you an example around that, we've got a number of suppliers that will have multiple contracts with those suppliers and potentially therefore multiple interfaces by different people across the organization. Mm -hmm. And we think that there is a better way of being able to uh, manage some of those relationships across with the supply chain where they're not going to have multiple points of interface with different parts of the organization where we've got uh, multiple contracts against effectively one supplier, which we have got in a number of cases, and we want to manage that interface in a much, much more strategic way. Mm. Would that new system allow you to see to, to see that? Uh, the new system would allow us to see that much better. OK. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Uh, any other points they wish to raise? OK, then we'll, we'll push on if we may, Rachel. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So what I this is a bit wordy, this slide, and I apologise, but we are going to kind of go through go through some slightly more exciting kind of slides that follow this. But what I wanted to do, do was just to kind of set out the kind of headlines in terms of what we're thinking about in terms of and it's more than thinking now. Actually, we're getting to the point where we've got kind of emerging draft documents and I wanted to give you the headlines around that. So. Um, in terms of our emerging thinking, we've already talked about the fact that we will be developing effectively a responsible procurement policy. Um, and uh, what's important around that is we want that responsible procurement policy to be embedded across all areas of the commercial cycle. And I think that that's one of the benefits, I have to say, of the new function, which is previously kind of contract SRM, contract management SRM was sat under a different kind of line management hierarchy. Bringing all of this into place enables us to make sure that our policies cut across all of our commercial activity. And we'll see in a minute why that's important, but, but basically a responsible procurement policy that covers all elements of the commercial activity, whether that be around the procurement of a new uh, of a new service, but then also the ongoing contract management of that. Um, we we like actually the government's approach around what they describe as their PPNs, which are their new kind of their new I think policy notes, which are very simple. 
They're not overly complicated, but they're a very kind of neat way of being able to capture very quickly a kind of new policy intent effectively. Well, they're doing it for the whole of central government and potentially beyond. But we like that model um, and how it potentially could work uh, for the council. Um, so um, we will be, as one of those policy notes, which will hang off our responsible procurement, obviously you will be aware that we are in the process of developing a new, I think, more ambitious, and I'll go on and talk about why it's more ambitious, social value policy that covers all of the sourcing lifestyle, uh, life cycle, sorry, rather than lifestyle. Um, and that social value policy uh, will be mandated. So you will recall that in the um, social value legislation dating back to 2012, it is discretionary. What we want to do is to make it a, a mandated weighting effectively for Cornwall Council. Um, and as well as a mandated weighting for all new procurements for social value, what we also want to do effectively is to make the carbon element of that social value, a mandated requirement to reflect the fact that actually this is kind of front and centre stage really in terms of a cross-cutting policy of the council. Um, we really like the TOMS and I think one of the reasons we like the TOMS is it's been very, very difficult to actually put a financial value around the social value that we get from our contracts. Um, and, you know, I've talked to you about the kind of scale of what we're kind of transacting in procurement. And one of the other challenges that we've got is whilst we might be able to identify effectively that value through an individual procurement, how do I then aggregate that up over a large number of contracts to be able to demonstrate back to the organisation that the aggregate of all of that social value is this against these indicators? And that's where I think we really, really need to get to, because at the moment it's kind of it's not visible to anybody and therefore we're not able to ask the right questions around it. So we are proposing and we will be we will be proposing that we look at adopting the national TOMS. But I think that some of our other reflections around this are about how do we make the TOMS relevant, absolutely relevant to Cornwall? Um, and so um, Meg has been having some discussions effectively um, with the national leads around the TOM. So I don't know, Meg, if you want just to update the inquiry around where we're thinking about going in terms of how we make this relevant to Cornwall in terms of the use of this. Yes, absolutely. So working with the Social Value Portal, who are the company that run a portal that supports the TOMS, they're also responsible for a TOMS task force, which updates the TOMS and makes them relevant on an annual basis. Um, they are willing to or able to work with us to do some consultancy to make sure those TOMS, in terms of their measurement proxy metrics, are suitable and relevant to Cornwall. So that will be using information, including national statistics and looking at index of deprivation, just to do a big calculation analysis and make sure these measures are relevant for our area. Thank you. Thanks, Meg. Um, so we want to use the TOMS. We really like the model, but what we're going to do is um, make them relevant effectively for, for Cornwall. And we will have then kind of Cornish proxies using effectively uh, Cornish data that sits behind those. Um, and then the proposal would be that actually we would be able to aggregate up effectively the, the social value that's coming out or being delivered through those TOMs so that that has an organisation wide visibility rather than where we are at the moment, which is we don't have we don't have a consistent way of being able to measure social value, nor do we have effectively an ability to be able to aggregate that up and report on it. So that's kind of where we want to move to. And I'll go on and explain that in a little bit more detail. Um, the other thing just to comment is that um, clearly the uh, council owned companies are contracting authorities in their own right. So the CoreServe group is a contracting authority in its own right, which means um, that the legal framework effectively applies to it as well as applying to the council. 
So uh, we are wanting to make sure that actually the policy framework that we're developing here is one that can also be adopted effectively by the council owned companies. Now, obviously, we cannot obligate this at the moment. We're in negotiation with them to make sure that effectively this is something as a contracting authority in their own right that they are uh, they are committed to signing up to. And those are negotiations that are taking place. Um, the other thing just to add, and I think this goes back, John, to your opening comment about the social value is one part of this, but what else are we doing about effectively supporting that value through the Cornish supply chain is we're also looking at whether it is possible for um, a, certain, a certain value of procurement that we actually mandate that the default around that certain value of procurement, so this will clearly be below OGU because above OGU we're governed by kind of very strict rules around that, but below OGU we're looking at and exploring whether we can actually mandate that it is um, a default requirement to look at awarding effectively to a Cornish supplier um, first. Um, now, there might be some parts of the marketplace where it simply is not in existence and the council needs the service. But I think what we want to do is to actually think about how does this policy and the ambition of this policy set out effectively? How do officers work? And we think that the default around that should be that we look at Cornish suppliers first for a particular band of procurement, not for all of it, because we can't do that because it, it would not be uh, it would not accord with the legal framework. But for below a certain value, we think that potentially could be of real benefit in terms of uh, a, gar a kind of guarantee of, of funding to come into the uh, into the Cornish supply chain. Um, and then and then our final point is, and I think um, what we've got to just be a little bit careful about with the national TOMS is, and I think probably you, you, you heard the feedback around this, is that the TOMS allow for um, innovation. Um, and what we don't want to do is to become almost so restrictive at the point at which effectively a provider responds to a bid that actually we're losing the innovation that that provider um, is able to bring to the table. Because actually where we want to get to is we want to get to the point where the supply chain is leading us around innovation. And what I want to do is to make sure we don't end up with a policy that constrains or restricts innovation. So that's a, another important consideration in terms of some of the things that we're thinking about uh, going forward. I'm wondering if we could just move on to the next slide. Uh, before we do, uh, yeah. Rachel, um, yeah. John, John's got a question and I, I've got a question, if we may. Yeah, I yeah. just wanted to ask, um, we had a, a presentation from several other local authorities. Yeah. I noticed that uh, I think it was Plymouth uh, City Council had actually aligned a percentage of local suppliers to their procurement system. Uh, of course, you can't just have all, as you quite rightly said, we can't have local suppliers completely. We have to spread it out a little bit. But they had a, a sort of a percentage and then they slowly increased that percentage over time. But I, I get your point, though. I mean, frankly, um, we need to spend more time in areas where you can add most value. And I think don't make it too overly complicated. And I'd like some assurance that that is actually happening at the moment. Yeah. Um, so so um, in terms of in terms of Plymouth, um, what they what they've done is they've done some work around kind of pre-registration of their local providers to make it much easier for them to bid. Um, and actually, that was one of the points in the motion. Um, and our new um, e-procurement system, effectively, uh, we will be able to look at kind of pre-registering the local supply chain so that every time they bid for something, they're not having to kind of input that information again and again and again, which is effectively what happens at the moment, which is just, just not kind of user friendly at all, particularly for some of that kind of lower value activity. But I think, and we'll we'll go on and explain this. I I, I think hopefully uh, your point, John, around this being absolutely proportionate um, is is really 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 important because we shouldn't be expecting effectively suppliers who are bidding for 25 k of work to be going through effectively the same rigor that effectively a I don't know a five million pound. Uh, 
contracted supply would be going through in terms of their demonstration of social value. And I hope, I hope in terms of, and I'll go on and explain our thinking around this, I hope that you can see that actually we thought through those different bandings in a much, much more proportionate response in terms of actually how we are driving out the value point. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Thank you for that. Carol, would you like to ask a question, please? Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, um, this is sort of following on a little bit from from John because it just um, it always reminds me when we first um, started off one of our first sessions, um, we had the Chamber of Commerce and it's around this um, encouraging uh, the, the smaller um, Cornwall suppliers. And, and the first thing that w the question he was asked was he just felt that the, the system needed to be simpler to encourage more people to um, to come along and, and tender. Um, but that seemed to be helped by a lot of um, events, you know, presentations and, and helping people along. And that just seems to me that that may be a way for smaller suppliers and larger amounts of smaller suppliers to um, to find a way around it. Because it, it, it just seems that if we want more of the smaller supplier, we need to have, um, and it seems to me, an easier process, really. Yeah. It's not really a question. It's a bit of a statement, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, I mean, I think I think. Uh, Carol, I think we we agree with that. So I think um, one of the things that we have done is um, so for um, for awards of contracted activity under twenty five k, they there is no obligation effectively to use our e procurement system, and actually the council only seeks one bid. So um, as part of effectively the changes as part of the CPRs last last time it went, well actually it wasn't last time, it was, it was in the summer, it was meant to go earlier than that for council. There were some things that we did around simplifying that. Um, the, the other thing that I think will make a difference is this ability effectively for the slightly higher value procurements is this pre the fact that it's going to be much, much more user friendly than our current system. And as part of the as part of the implementation of that, there's going to have to be a whole load of work that we're doing then with the supply chain around kind of making sure that people are registered once we've got this system up and running in, in, in the early spring next year. I think I think I think um, I think also I, I was kind of talking to kind of my team earlier on today about our uh, we, we've we've created a balanced scorecard um, around our commercial activity, um, and and one of the areas that I want to absolutely have visibility around, which I don't at the moment across all of our activity, is the number of um, the the number of responses that we get back to to any tender, because in a way that should be a barometer of actually how much yeah. market engagement we've done and how attractive this is. Now, at the moment, we're not capturing that. And I was talking to Meg, who's been very helpfully helping construct this balanced scorecard about saying that's another indicator that we as an organisation have absolutely got to understand aggregated again across all of our procurements. So we can see actually whether we've been successful in doing our kind of pre-market pre engagement work around making this attractive to people. Absolutely. That that for me would be the, the uh, you know the absolute core of, of of getting it going because if they don't know where to go and they don't know where to 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 get into the first step of these things, um, they won't do it, will they? So if if we if we knew where the extra work needed to be done, that's just just way to go. I think that's lovely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Rachel, firstly, I I did briefly speak to the growth hub today. Uh, and they would be interested in reading about the work we're doing here uh, and helping um, companies access contracts for Cornwall Council. Yeah. The second thought I had was the social value, could that actually um, aggregate back to the subcontractors? So uh, the main contractor, yes. the main contractor actually sponsors a sort of an apprenticeship in the subcontractor and that becomes the social value of the contract. And yes. so we develop a Cornish business, and we and we get our social value at the same time. Yeah, we are having we are having exactly this conversation, Martin, this morning about. Um, I think my challenge back to the team and also with kind of legal colleagues is how can we find a way if so if we award a contract um, and 
you know, that contract award is based on a certain contribution in terms of social value, but then there is a supply chain, an extended supply chain that actually is supporting the delivery of that contract. How do I absolutely know that that value passes all the way through that supply chain? Um, so um, we, we have about how do I know that absolutely confidently? What would that look like in, in terms of our contracts as a standard set of clauses that make it absolutely obligatory to pass that, that kind of benefit when we're awarding a contract all the way through the supply chain? So those are those are absolutely mm -hmm. discussions that before we can before we conclude this social value policy, I want to have concluded with legal because I, I agree with you that if we're awarding a contract on a certain premise, which is X amount of value, then I want to make sure that actually that value is passed all the way through the supply chain. Mm, okay. We've so, just got to work uh, out the mechanism of yeah. being able to do it contractually. Um, a shorter, shorter supply chains, of course, would help. Um, and uh, what we heard from some authorities is they're actually putting into a lot of resources into uh, monitoring contracts as they're delivered and, um, uh, and, and making sure that the, the contract uh, is meeting what is asked of it. Yeah. Members, any, any more? I will ask Rachel to move on. Okay, Rachel, press on. Thank you. Thank you. Could, so, um, oh, if you can just turn on to the next slide. So, um, this effectively just very, very high level sets out um, the different elements that will be covered off by our new responsible procurement policy. And then uh, falling out of that will be, as I said, those seven, what, what, what in government speak is called the PPN, so the policy notes that will effectively set out the detail of how we are going to deliver each of those elements. And of course, the first one to come forward is absolutely um, the social value element, but there is an overarching, I have a draft at the moment that's been worked on, an overarching responsible procurement policy, and then we will have the detailed effectively policy notes that sets out how they will be uh, delivered. And I think, uh, Martin, going back to your earlier point about how do we expect the cascade of that all the way through the supply chain, all the way through the supply chain will be an absolute expectation. We're just working at the moment through the mechanics of how we actually go about doing that and transacting it. Mm. So if we can we can move on. So I think I think the other thing just to also highlight, I think this drawing is a really kind of good visual of um, very, very, very high level, the kind of the activity that's undertaken within commercial services. And this drawing has been effectively extrapolated outside of our, out of our uh, new operating model that was signed up to as part of the CPRs and all of the work that we've been doing over the last year. And I think the really important thing is that I think that there has been as part of kind of social value and focus on the marketplace, it's been a real focus on kind of procurement. There's been less of a focus, I think, the transaction of the procurement, the actual process of the buying. Um, and where we have been trying to move the team to over the last, well, probably six to six months to a year is doing much more work in the space around the category management and the planning, which is the market and the market engagement work, the kind of really understanding kind of what we're purchasing, understanding where the supply chain is, understanding where there are gaps to then inform effectively the approach that we take around the actual management of the procurement bit. And then the other bit in terms of the area of focus that we've been doing a lot of work on, and we've been doing that for a bit long, we've been doing that probably for about the last two to three years, and actually I think we're in a really good space around that, is as an organisation, how do we make sure that once we've committed the contract during the procurement phase, we are managing the value that that contract brings over the whole life of the contract? And I, and I guess for me, I kind of use the analogy of kind of acute care in the NHS. It's the kind of it's almost the procurement stage is the A&E bit, but then there's the long term management bit that has to happen after the award of the actual contract itself. And I think that traditionally councils have ended up kind of focusing on the procurement bit, but not really driving that value over the lifetime of the contract. And bearing in mind, you know, some of our contracts can be yesterday I was having a conversation about a contract in EG&D that was awarded in 2014, that there's another kind of eight year extension period to. 
And lots of the conversations that we were having were actually when this contract was originally awarded, it was a very, very different policy contact context. How are we making sure that effectively we are continually kind of refreshing those <laughs> contracts as much as we can within the parameters of those contracts over the lifetime of the contract to continue to maximise value for the council? And so for me, what this slide is saying is that the responsible procurement policy is not just about the procurement bit, the bit in the middle. In a way, the bit in the middle is the easy bit. Where we've got to be focusing our value proposition is around getting upstream around category management and planning and making sure that we're developing our markets and downstream, which is around effectively the management of the relationship and making sure that that contract, as well as delivering the services, is continuing to drive out value. So that's that's what, what this slide is about. Um, if we can move on. So um, some of our some of our thinking. So I think um, a little while ago we spoke about kind of OJU um, and um, if, if something hits an OJU threshold in terms of a kind of in terms of a procurement value. So different procurements have different values. And the OG value effectively is determined over the whole of the duration of the contract. So depending on the value of that contract over the lifetime of its duration should we should determine also how it's treated and the legal framework effectively that we have to uh, that we have to kind of wrap around that. So OJU for different types of contracts. So for supply and services, effectively an OJU contract uh, would be about 189k this year. Obviously, it changes. Um, so for capital projects, it's 4.7 million pounds, and that's where the kind of the big legal framework tends to kind of uh, tends to kind of um, um, tip into kind of work in. So, so going back, um, John, to your earlier comments around a kind of proportionate response. So. Um, and anything we're proposing, and this is a proposal at the moment to be kind of tested, um, is anything below £25,000. We at the moment operate a kind of one quote policy. Where we want to go to there is to actually look at making effectively local suppliers the default. So they would be considered first before we go anywhere else. Um, and the comment in the side sets out we will effectively make a determination around that. Now, clearly all of this is going to require a big cultural shift across the organisation because actually quite often we don't have any visibility as a commercial team around effectively those 0 to 25k. Um, but what we are proposing effectively there is that we will be looking at using effectively local, local suppliers first um, unless there is a very, very good reason why we can't and then we would we would move away from that default position. Anything between 25k and OJU, um, again, kind of this is low, lower value stuff. So we don't want to kind of overburden effectively the supply with lots and lots and lots of complexity here. Uh, what we talked about there effectively is a weighting, a minimum weighting of 10% in line effectively with the government's PPN position. Um, and I think the important thing is, is in terms of the documentation that will sit underneath this, obviously effectively, there will be a lot less kind of rigor in terms of the requirement around that 25k to OJU in terms of the completion of social value that there would be around the OJU plus. And then we move to effectively the OJU plus, which tend to be our much bigger um, strategic and critical effectively uh, procurements. And here we are going further than government in respect of this, um, where we are saying that we want to move to a position of 15% weighting around social value. Um, now, that becomes a default position. There might be certain circumstances where we can't move to that, but what we don't want to do is to go below a minimum of 10%. And I think the important thing is that the social value kind of proportionate and very aligned to the subject matter is of effectively that procurement. So that's another quite important consideration when we're starting to determine effectively the selection uh, of the TOMS in terms of how we're going to measure that. Um, and, and 
I think just just before we just move on to that slide, one of the things that's come out of some of the conversations that we've been having with central government, and it's really interesting because I actually it hadn't even occurred to me before, is that in terms of the government's PPN around all of their procurements, it's kind of how do they actually then identify where that social value goes? Because the great thing about us is what we've got is a geography, a defined geography that we know that that 15% can make a real difference in terms of the value that that will bring to effectively Cornwall, whereas central government have got a much bigger challenge around how they attribute that 10% um, in terms of that value proposition. So I, I see that uh, Robin's put a, a cross mm. in the box, Martin. Do you want me to respond to that before before we move on to the next slide? Yeah, I I I, I want us to get a uh, just move slightly more swiftly on, perhaps. Uh, Robin, do you want to ask? Yeah, a quick question, and thank you, thank you, Rachel. Um, your top right hand corner it says about determining using the first three digits of the postcode. Well, if you look at Bude, they've got an exit of postcode. Are they are companies up around the Bude area going to lose out on any contracts? Um, that's a very good question. Thank you, Robin. I think uh, we're going to need to take we're going to need to take that back. I think um, I think this was kind of crudely. How do we measure? And I I will need to go back and how we look at measuring effectively the Cornish suppliers as they currently stand, as we've got um, as we're using we're using effectively postcodes. So let me take that one away. But the principle absolutely around this is that they will be Cornish suppliers within effectively the geography of Cornwall. Lovely, thank you. We've got to just work out how we're going to, how we're going to actually determine that. So I think that's a, that's a very helpful comment. Thank you. And I see James as well. Thank you. <laughs> yes. OK, so uh, I, I'll move us, uh, Martin, kind of more quickly on around this. So this is just to give you a kind of visual. So uh, depending on what we're trying to assess as part of any procurement, so where price is important, effectively, uh, it could look something like that. Where quality is important, effectively, it could look something like that. And then the final one is where we think that there is a really big social value opportunity. Potentially, we will be looking at going kind of higher, higher further. So. Uh, so, so that's kind of where we are with that. And I think, I think the important thing here is we want to make social value, the assessment of social value, an explicit part of the overall evaluation of the procurement weighting, which we have not, we have not done before. And we want to have a common kind of methodology around how we're going to do that to be able to draw that out. Next slide. Um, so. Um, so the TOMS, um, and I think that um, I think you've looked at the TOMS. As I said, I'm kind of I'm interested in the TOMS because it gives us a kind of proxy value um, and uh, an ability also to be able to compare ourselves kind of with what's going on nationally. Um, but we recognise, though, in terms of the kind of golden thread, that the TOMS need to link back to um, the councils. Uh, outcomes and their objectives and what we've done is some work around kind of trying to map effectively the TOMS across in terms of golden thread to the strategic objectives of um, of the Cornwall plan. Um, now, now one of the because there is a question around do we use the council's business plan or do we use the Cornwall plan? Um, and we're still kind of umming and ahhing around that. One of the advantages around the Cornwall plan is clearly in terms of potential anchor organisations signing up to this social value policy. Given that it's a partnership document, it might make it easier in terms of partnership. Uh, those other anchor organisations signing up to this policy once we're kind of once we're developing this further. But either way, I think the important principle here is that the TOMS will align to, in terms of the golden thread, uh, the, the the local Cornish effectively priorities and the outcomes that we're wanting to achieve. If we can just move on. Um, I think I've probably covered all of that off. I've talked about the golden thread. Um, the only thing also probably just to say is that what we will do is we will be building in explicitly as part of effectively our procurement business cases and all of our procurement documentation, like effectively our category strategy, um, the, the measurement of social value. And one of the things that we are toying with at the moment is whilst we kind of want to mandate an overall 
um, waiting is within that waiting, there might be effectively certain TOMs that we want to say for all procurements, they're mandatory. And I think I alluded to that in terms of the carbon objectives of the council. And so one of the things that we've been talking about is do we make sure that that carbon objective in terms of the TOMs is given an automatic 5% weighting as part of any kind of procurement weighting going forward so that we make sure that consistently across every single procurement that becomes an absolute priority that we're pushing through this agenda. Next, next slide. So, so this just gives you, and you all have this, but what we've done effectively is to map effectively all of the TOMs back against effectively uh, the Cornwall plan outcome measures so that actually we can start to identify um, the golden thread approach and make sure that they're absolutely relevant effectively to Cornwall. And I guess I guess what I would say is um, in terms of your recommendations that you might want to consider, it's obviously at the moment one of the objectives is around, um, around percentage of spend on Cornish suppliers as a kind of proxy measure. I think that there is something important about thinking about these indicators that has been probably a much more sophisticated set of indicators of value to Cornwall. And you might want to think about actually what your recommendations are around how Cornwall kind of more widely uses those, because I think they're really good. OK, next one. Um, so. Um, other considerations, I thought it would just be helpful because I think, uh, Martin, you alluded to, to, the, to the fact that at the very beginning, as well as this, there's obviously an awful lot of other kind of work that's going on at the moment across uh, commercial services, not least responding to effectively a COVID crisis and making sure we're geared up to, to Brexit. But um, we've, we've also got, obviously, the response to the motion and some of the elements of the motion will be responded to as part of uh, this work. Um, but uh, we we just also wanted to highlight that there is also some work going on around the other elements of the motion. Um, and I've asked for colleagues to make sure that there is a meeting before Christmas around formally responding to these bits before it goes back to full council, I think, in January. Um, the other bit also just to mention is that there is a meeting in December uh, with the, the there's a national group called the Sustainable Procurement um, um, organization that really help public sector organizations think through effectively their response to across their supply chain, the challenge that we've got around kind of obviously around kind of carbon. And so our social value obviously has reflected that, but we think that there are other things that, that we can do in relation to that. So there's a there's a workshop that's taking place um, in, de, in in later on in December about what we're going to do in respect of that, and that's likely to form another PPN effectively as part of our responsible procurement policy. Just moving on really quickly. Um, all of this is going to require. Um, an implementation and embedding and cultural change and leadership. Um, and what this slide does is to set out very, very high level. Um, if we uh, sign up to effectively this approach as a council, then there's going to be some things to happen. Um, and I, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I think what I'm saying is this requires a kind of a leadership shift. It requires a fundamental belief in actually why we're doing this in terms of kind of really bringing value to kind of Cornwall. And then there are a whole load of things that uh, we need to be doing as an organisation and as a supply chain around kind of embedding this. But um, I kind of I feel confident we're, we're absolutely kind of we, we've got a kind of plan around making that happen. But it won't it won't just happen effectively by some colleagues in a commercial in a commercial team making it happen, it's going to require a whole organisational effort. Next slide. Um, this slide, I just wanted to just very quickly kind of recap on the things that we're doing to support the voluntary sector um, and other things that we're doing to support effectively uh, the Cornish supply chain. And um, you will have heard, you will have heard from Mark that we cannot specify that we contract with Cornish suppliers, particularly for uh, for uh, OGU related activity or the equivalent effectively coming out of the green paper. But there are things that we can be doing effectively to uh, to help ensure that actually 
uh, bits of the supply chain are in a good place to be able to respond. And I think um, I think um, uh, 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 other, other people have made some good comments that it's not the responsibility of a commercial team to do all of that. There are lots of other infrastructure organisations that are also around that have a responsibility to also make sure that happens because clearly they will be responding to effectively bids coming through my team. But I wanted just to kind of highlight very quickly some of the work that we're doing. Some of it links back to effectively much better planning and category, category strategies, having proper category strategies in place that understand effectively where our markets are. Going back to the point I said earlier on about how many bids do we get effectively for each Procurement. It's a pretty good barometer, really, of actually how much market engagement have we done. Um, so that's a that's a key that's a key thing that we've been really working on over the last kind of year. But it's something that kind of we can always always improve on, and I kind of expect us to improve on that. Um, the other thing which I don't think we've we've ever done as a council is lots of organisations will say we can gear up to this if we know it's going to happen. And what I don't think we to be clear enough as a council about actually what the new business opportunities might be coming over the next year so that actually the set so that different sectors are able to kind of gear up to that um, and I think that there is something for us about making sure that we are really kind of publishing um, our forward plan but giving enough notice around our forward plan clearly we have to advertise all procurements but that's almost kind of a, a little bit before the procurement happens what I'm talking about here is kind of something that makes a statement to the market that says these are going to be our emerging business opportunities over the next year so that's a that's a kind of really I think important piece of work um, Rob and I have been doing lots of work effectively with the uh, voluntary sector forum and Vera around how we work collaboratively and there's further the work to be done around that. Um, we have for the last two years as part of the approach we've had around contract management and supplier relationship management had an annual supplier summit with key members of cabinet um, and the executive um, and that's been a whole day event with our strategic and critical suppliers, which has been really, really well received. That has been a kind of forum around aligning effectively their business plan, plan priorities and the council's business plan priorities. Now, this year that hasn't happened for obvious reasons because of COVID, but uh, we've had two of them so far and they've been really, really positively received. And I don't want to lose the momentum around that. So that will be something that will happen again in spring of next year. Um, and then there are the specific kind of supplier events that we hold. And I have to say that lots of our procurements, particularly our more complex, bigger procurements over OGU, most of them have a degree of kind of market engagement where we are meeting with various different markets to kind of gear them up to the procurements around that. So that 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 does happen. I think our, our uh, e-procurement portal will make things easy. We've talked about. And then finally, just kind of making reference to the fact that there is a new PPN coming out, as I said earlier, around our below OG procurements and what flexibilities and freedoms we might have um, to be able to effect effectively work uh, with our below OG uh, providers. Can we just quickly whip on? So next steps, um, we 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 been doing a lot of work on this. We've got the drafts in place. I think I've highlighted some of the kind of key areas in terms of where we're going around this. Uh, clearly, that's still got to kind of work its way through effectively. It's testing with the supply chain um, and uh, with other stakeholders within the council before it gets to its kind of final approval. Um, the other big bit really for me this week is the green paper. I want to make sure that there is nothing that we are saying that we're going to be doing that's going to be out of step with effectively the procurement uh, green paper that's going to be coming out. And I'm I'm waiting to see that. I'm being advised and I don't think that anything we're doing is out of kilter with that in terms of a direction of travel. But I just want to make sure that kind of at the end of this week or early next week, our recommendations are absolutely aligned in terms of our approach to that green paper. Um, and then um, in the early new year, um, we will be looking at taking it through its approval process. Um, and I, I guess one of the things uh, 
uh, that I I kind of wanted to just kind of question is in terms of your report, when your report goes to scrutiny, which clearly is your report, is it might be helpful also in terms of the response to that report, if there's an opportunity for us to be able to kind of present that, because we'll be a long way on then in terms of these draft documents at that point, kind of are thinking about that. And I would would welcome your your kind of thoughts around that. So I think I think that's probably it. Oh, fantastic. fantastic. <laughs> 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 um, I'm, I, I think we recognised the, the complexity of this subject from the start uh, and also that it was an area that was moving very, very rapidly. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about our timetable and moving forward. We were going to take uh, questions from our, our members first and then um, go uh, switch off the recording and then go into an informal session. So um, formally members, have you got any questions you wish to ask in this session? Uh, if not, I intend then to stop the recording and we will go into an informal session, which will allow some of our observers to participate as well. So members of the inquiry. Yeah, I've John. got an act in the box, Chairman. Thank you, John. Yeah, just very quickly, Rachel. I think that last point you made was very, very important. When we present the findings of this investigation panel or uh, working group to, to our mother uh, scrutiny committee, then it's important that you are there. Can you take you on? I'm, I'm not second guessing you or you, you know, but no. I think that would be very important <clears throat> for us because it is a very complicated situation at the moment and we need to sort of uh, find a way through it. Um, that's my experience as a, as a former chairman as well. So there you go. I'd uh, be interested to hear what Jane's got to say. Um, yeah, thank you, John. I'll bring Jane in when we when we enter into the uh, informal session. Um, Rachel, uh, you, you mentioned there a contract that's got uh, being renewed for another eight years. Hmm. Um, uh, then what what chance are, uh, is there of influence in that contract or or actually is there any influence at all or will that contract simply forward for another eight years with us and uh, uh, not getting any added value out of it? Yeah, OK. I mean, that that uh, that that contract is a is a very interesting one. I'm not going to name the contract for obvious reasons no. in terms of commercial sensitivities. Um, I have to say this provider um, is one of our much bigger providers. They're a, a national uh, provider, but they've set up uh, an office in Cornwall. They're employing Cornish people. They signed up to the foundation living wage uh, way before I think it was a policy requirement of the council um, and um, have got very, very, very ambitious carbon indicators. And one of the conversations that we had yesterday through the commercial governance um, was a conversation about, uh, because there's a four and a four year extension period around this, that it is a provider that invests lots of capital. Um, and uh, some of the challenge that took place at that meeting, and in fact, it was not concluded was, if we made the decision to extend it for eight years as opposed to four years, what is the additional value that we will get as a council and across Cornwall by that extension? And they, the people that presented that have been tasked with going away and properly setting out those different options around the additional we would get for going for the eight year extension rather than the four plus four. And so these points at which we make a decision to extend a contract become critical windows, I guess, windows of opportunity that we've got to shape effectively social value, which is why that slide around category management, procurement um, and contract management becomes so important because I think that I've got probably three or three or four key areas to be able to really shape the supply chain. The first is at the point at which we go out to procurement, having done all the work up front. But the second is where we've got in contracts the ability to be able to extend those contracts. How do we use that pause button as a way of saying if we are going to extend, 
what's the added value that you get and how do I at that point actually weave in some of these social value policy expectations and hopefully what you'll see is as part of the emerging policy is that we're not just looking at the point of procurement we're also looking at it across the whole of the the whole of the uh, commercial life cycle which includes those moments within effectively a contract extension. Mm, that, uh, um... Yeah, yeah, I see the opportunity. It also sounds quite resource intensive that uh, getting all that work done at that contract it, pause point. It is. And that's where I think, Martin, it's got to be absolutely your point around proportionate is absolutely right. In a contract where we're talking about multi-million pounds worth of additional you know, life left on the contract is absolutely right that we spend the time in terms of the resource around driving the value out. Mm. Um, thank you. Uh, now the members, um, I, I, I intend to draw this formal session to uh, an end. Uh, I hope the officers will remain and we can carry on and bring in some of the informal observers because uh, there's some of those have got questions as well. So if sorry, not, Martin, can I just have a sorry, I put an X in the box. I'm not sure it's arrived, is it? It's Carol. Uh, yes, Carol. Yes, okay. sorry. It's just a quick one for Rachel. So Rachel, if we're looking at um, contract management and we have uh, somebody come along and we set them up and it's all going along swimmingly but at some point the management's looking at it and it's not going so swimmingly how do we then how do we intervene in that how do we see the intervention around that and 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 correcting it yeah i mean so there will be different levels of escalation carol in any contract um around uh, how serious, I guess, that uh, that failure is within that provider. Um, so uh, we we set out um, as part of the contract, effectively the frequency of those con contract management meetings, the information that we require to be able to assess effectively how that contract's performing. Um, and depending on what the contract says, it will be dependent on the specific nature of the contract, will determine then what management action we take. And to give you an example around that, you know, I've got probably at the moment a handful of suppliers and contracts that we are very, very closely watching because we are concerned about those suppliers or contracts um, failing or tipping because of a whole range of different issues. And those are kind of, those are monitored very, very closely on a monthly basis. Some of those are big national contracts that we would have locally that we're having to link across with government around in terms of uh, the treatment of the management of those contracts. So the contract determines effectively the escalation process. I have to say that our contract management and supplier relationship management has really improved over the last, as an organisation, over the last couple of years. And we have an agreed model around that that makes effectively the performance of those really important contracts much, much more visible to us as an organisation. Lovely. Thank you. That's fine. It's reassuring. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, well, thank you, members. Thank you, officers. I'm going to draw this formal session to a, a, a close now. Um, I, I thank you for your presentations. Thank you for a, a very interesting debate as well. Um, we're going to close the session now um, and uh, we will then pick up uh, in, in, in an informal session going forward. So thank you very much. Tracy, could you turn the recording?